and uh, good morning. And can I just welcome everybody here today. Um, I've got a special welcome for Roy Fleming, who is here to lead us in today's service. Uh, Roy's been with us before, and we're looking forward to hearing from you later on. Um, I just have a few announcements. Uh, the first one is, if you need the service of a minister this week, if you can contact your elder or myself, and my number is on the church website. And the last announcement is, Lasara Church, they are running a youth week the, this week, and it starts at 7.30 to 9, and it's from 11 plus, and it's uh, meeting in the score in Cross Gar. I will leave this leaflet just in the vestibule if you need any more information. Thank you. Ian, thanks so very much. The last time I was here, you will remember, <laughs> perhaps, that I was doing the little course for the accredited preaching. And of course, I was thwarted by preaching, in my preaching by COVID. <laughs> we, very few of the, the accredited preachers then uh, had much work to do because of COVID. And so I never ever did get to thank you very much for your patience. I often think when the Bible speaks about love, the first thing it says is that love is patient. And believe me, I was so glad that you folks were patient with me when I was here last. So we come here this morning. We come in the midst of a world that seems to be in turmoil. A world where things that we took for granted for many years, the family structures and the ways of life. And what are we seeing? We're seeing many of them split asunder. And we just cry out to God that he will mend and the way he will mend is that each one of us establish not just a knowledge about him, but a friendship with him in Christ and in Christ alone. The only answer we have to the maladies that we have. I'm reading from Psalm 65. Praise await you, our God in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave us our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. That's the reason why we're here. Let's bow in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, this morning we come to worship a father who in so many ways is a mystery to us. A father God, there is no mystery about the love you have for us. Father, when we look to Jesus, we begin to see what you are really like. We can feel the warmth of a glorious Father who has shown us grace that we simply don't deserve. Many, Lord, our God, are the wonders you have performed and the things you plan for us. None can compare with you. Were we to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too numerous to declare. Lord, we praise you that in your creation, that that creation, even without words, cries out and declares your glory. You have created us. You have given us life. You have demonstrated your love for us by offering us new life in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, let our lives, like the rest of creation, 
cry out and declare your deeds. Let us fearlessly testify to your grace that draws us back to you, that others may come to know our Savior. Father, forgive us when we think ourselves better than we ought, when we begin to believe that we have the answers to the sin in our lives. Lord, we confess that we often place ourselves rather than you at the very center. So often our silence acts to deny you. Indeed, Lord, others may accuse of us of being mere spectators. So often you make the way clear and yet we choose our own way. Lord, help us to surrender our will so that all we do is driven by the prompting and the power of your Holy Spirit. Forgive us when we fail to live lives that reflect your love. Forgive us those thankless times when we take for granted all that you have done for us. Lord Jesus, help us when the voices in this world try to hold us back from truly knowing you. Transform us through your spirit and empower us to really know you, really know you, and to serve you. We pray in the name that is above all names, Jesus, who in his death and resurrection rescued us. Amen. Amen. I don't know, we don't seem to have too many children, but seriously, whoever you are, if you're there, Please come down to help. You'll help me out greatly. I would be lost without the children coming down. I really would. Please come down. See what we can do. Any children coming down? Oh, yeah, you're on your way. Why do they not do an extension with slides? Just with slides. <laughs> the older folks will always remember. And they'll say, oh, here, another bag. You ever notice when ministers come in and they, they have a bag and they'll... I, the, one, the, the question that often really takes me to the fair... Could you guess what I've got in here? <laughs> and I said, well, it could be anything, couldn't it? But I'm going to tell you the truth. I've got sweeties in here. I, I can't be dishonest. I've got a bag, a big bag of sweeties. Those, you might not know, folks, but we who are older, remember the days when we used to go into a shop and there were big jars. Remember the big jars along? And uh, I don't know what your favourite sweets were, but you used to go in and you used to say, could I have two ounces? <laughs> an ounce? An ounce? Oh, but <laughs> um, there's a... <laughs> but you used to get two ounces or a quarter pound. Two ounces was 3D. A quarter pound was 6D. You wouldn't know what Ds were. It was way, way, way back. But I want one of you, could, could, could I have a, a, a volunteer, anybody volunteer? Just go, go on ahead. Go ahead. Right. Now, the folks are itching to know, come on up. The folks are itching to know what sort of sweets are in here. Okay, they, they, but you don't, don't you tell them. You just tell them what you see. What, what do you see? Red wrappers. Yeah. Shout. Red wrappers, you heard that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, brilliant helper. They've got creamy stuff on the inside. Creamy stuff on the inside, you heard that? Now, anybody, rem anybody remember the red wrapper? Creamy stuff. <laughs> oh, my goodness, how quick was that? <laughs> Raspberry ruffles. Thanks very much. You were brilliant. 
raspberry ruffles. I would say most people in here have tasted raspberry ruffles, but let's assume you hadn't tasted them. Would you have got a feel for what they were like? I what? What's your name? Rebecca. Ruby. Ruby. Ruby gave you a, a description. You could have said red wrapper on it, creamy on the inside, dark chocolate on the outside, berry flavour, some sort of berry flavour. Would you really have known? What was the best way for you to know? Sorry? Taste them. You know, the best way to taste it, the Bible actually says, there's a lovely verse uh, which is full of theology, but I, I wouldn't be up to it at all. But it says, taste and see. Taste and see. And blessed and be blessed. So, I'm chatting with the folks today a little bit about that. I don't know whether you go to children's church or whatever, but the rest of the folks will be staying here and we'll talk about tasting and seeing. So I'll tell you what to do. They're all sitting there with their tongues hanging out. Will you go around and give them all one? <laughs> give them all a raspberry ruffle. Oh, first of all, your friends. Yeah, yeah. And then the rest of the congregation, if, if, if you have enough, I think you have enough for downstairs. <laughs> and they have no ex <laughs> Yeah. So, so now you see why I don't like people sleeping away up under there. <laughs> uh, no, they, they'll, they'll, they won't have any excuse. Sure they won't. We're going to sing a chorus. We're going to sing a chorus. We're going to see if I can get this right. Oh, Jesus loved me. Will we sing this way? Now, it'll be slightly different to the normal. It'll be the way my many friends in the uh, African children's choir sing it. And it, it, it'll go. And that's the sort of temperature. And then when it comes to the, the chorus, it'll say, yes, Jesus loved me. Shout, yes. So we'll try it. Jesus love me, everybody. Just sit your seats. Don't, don't stand up. So, now I'll start off with a couple of you, Gordon. When I nod my head, hit it. Sorry, no, no. Everybody together now, coming up.
pray for the children for two seconds. Just before you go, folks, listen very carefully. Father God, I want these children to stop thinking about Jesus as a storybook character. And instead, I want them to know you as their friend and their saviour. Bless them as they go out to learn more about you in Children's Church. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read from scripture, and it's uh, John chapter 4, and I'm going to read from 7 to 26. I may have to say that just prior to 7, you will remember Jesus going from a point A to a point B, but instead of going straight, he went around to avoid Samaria. Uh, the Jews and the Samaritans were not and none too fond of each other. And it wasn't a burning hatred. It was theological differences. Because the people in Samaria actually did know there was a God of Israel. But let's read what happened when Jesus spoke to the lady. Presently, a Sumerian woman arrived to draw some water from the well. Please give me a drink, Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone away to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how can you, a Jew, ask for a drink? Drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus said, if you knew what God can give, Jesus replied. And if you knew who it was who said to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, said the woman, you have no bucket and this well is deep. Where can you get your living water? Are you a greater man than our ancestor, Jacob, who gave us the well and drank here himself with his family and his cattle? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never be thirsty again. For my gift will become a spring in the man himself, welling up into eternal life. The woman said, sir, Give me this water for that I may stop being thirsty and not have to make this journey to draw water anymore. Go and talk, call your husband and then come back here, said Jesus. I haven't got a husband, the woman answered. Jesus said, you are quite right in saying I haven't got a husband. For you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband at all. Yes, you spoke the truth when you said that. Sir, said the woman again, I can see that you're a prophet. Now our ancestors worshipped on this hillside, but you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Believe me, returned Jesus, the time is coming. When worshipping the Father will not be a matter of on this hill or in Jerusalem. Nowadays you're worshipping what you do not know. We Jews are worshipping what we do know. For the salvation of mankind has come from our race. 
Yet the time is coming, yes, and has already come, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in reality, in truth. Indeed, the Father looks for men who will worship him like that, in truth. God is spirit, and those who worship him can only worship in spirit and in truth. Of course, I know the Messiah is coming, returned the woman. You know, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will make everything plain to us. And Jesus said to her, I am the Christ speaking to you right now. Amen. I trust that the Lord will really bless that that powerful, powerful account to all our hearts and our minds. We're going to sing again a beautiful piece before the throne of God above. Let's stand and sing together. We're going to pray, and if I may say just before I do, and before we do, there's a bundle of paper here. A, I write everything, and you'll notice that I even read my prayers. Now, there are purists in pews who will say, oh, sure, all he does is read everything. Believe me, before I wrote it, I prayed about it. Before I wrote it, I searched scripture. So what I'm reading off is what my heart has engaged God with. But here's the other thing. The prayer now is called a prayer of intercession. Could I say something? There's half a dozen sheets of paper here. If I had started out wanting to pray for everything I truly want to, Six pages would not have done it. And you know the, the world we're living in. Half a dozen pages written of prayer would never co- cover what needs to be done with this world of ours and in this world of ours. And you, as a little church in County Down, 
have the power in your lives to start a spark that will change this world and change other people's lives by bringing Jesus to them. But I just say that because really the business of prayers for in, of intercession, and this is what we're going to do now, to pray for a few things that are really on my heart and I'm sure on your heart as well. So let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, so often we look around our fellowship and to the wider circle of people we meet, but we fail to see their hidden concerns, fears, and worries. You, Lord, know their hearts. You know what's really going on in the heads and the hearts and the minds of men and women here and men and women about our community. I'm asking you, Lord, to draw close to to us all that they may experience your love for them. We ask this morning for healing for comfort and encouragement to those we knew were facing challenges in their lives. We pray this morning for those facing health issues, that your presence would be known to them in comfort and in healing. Lord, at this very moment, there are families associated with our churches who are anxious about loved ones, whatever the needs may be. Perhaps younger families concerned about their young ones and the world that their young ones are living in and are feeding from. Father, we ask you for the healing of relationships anywhere where we find division and hurt. Father, empower each of us to work for you in your will, wherever healing and reconciliation is needed, even when it's in our churches. We pray for our nation, Lord. We are experiencing upheaval in social and family structures that once seemed secure. We see instability and uncertainty all around us. We see the very perfection and the beauty of your creation being marred by our failure as stewards. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to witness to others how to protect and to care for all that you have created for us. Lord, we pray for those in so many countries who suffer because of their love for you. Break into the lives of those who set about persecuting Christians in so many parts of the world. Guard, protect, and comfort your people, Lord, wherever they may be. Let them feel your presence, even in the worst of trials. Remind us all that whatever the conditions in this world, you are working out your eternal plan. Father, we thank you for the freedom that we enjoy here in Northern Ireland. The freedom to enjoy the gospel, the freedom to speak the name of Jesus without fear. But Father, persecution we know can be subtle. So we ask you that you place your protection around us. In those times, because of our faith, we are maligned and misrepresented in our communities. Merely for our faith, protect us, Lord. Father, we bring today those people in Ukraine Father, I pray for the little family that we have with us in First St. Field, and I pray for any Ukrainian families who are in this uh, uh, community. What a terrible war. What dishonesty there. Place on the hearts of leaders in this world the need to turn again to you and to find a way for their lives found only in Jesus. We pray that the hearts of your people in these countries will not grow weary or faint in these terrible times. 
Lord, give us the grace to demonstrate the love of our Savior to those we meet. And let our lives be a currency to be spent daily for the advancement of your kingdom. We pray with confidence in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'd like to share a few words with you. Jesus was talking to Peter. What a wonderful, wonderful experience that must have been in the very presence of Jesus. Feet on the ground stuff, sitting with him. And he asked Peter a question. There'd been a bit of debate going on. And he said to Peter, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Can you remember in a reading where Jesus said exactly that? He testified to his own position and who he really was. Remember the girl talked about the Messiah, the lady? And she said, but I who am standing talking to you I'm he. Have you ever noticed television abounds with stuff? I have to say I'm not a great, I'm not a great fan of television. I, I find some of it sadly reflecting things that I really don't think are, are worthy or noble. But you do get some amazing programs. I remember watching one night, uh, um, there, there was a program on from America, uh, and it was, a, it was a Christian program, and people had gone out into the street of New York, and they had asked people, what, you know, asked young people passing, uh, do you believe in Jesus? And what do you think about Jesus? And you get all sorts of, you, you can remember them yourself, you know, there's no point in me telling you, but I'll tell you anyway. Oh, Jesus is a good man. Jesus is a teacher. Jesus was a healer. Jesus is the leader of a religion. Now, there would be few people who would deny. It's, it came to me so many years ago as a surprise to know that it's not only in the Bible you can read about Jesus. There are many historic documents that refer to Jesus. So people do know a bit about Jesus. And in fact, in Northern Ireland, of all places, my goodness, it would be strange uh, not to... Not to hear people saying, oh yes, Jesus, and, and they would know quite a bit. And people in churches know a lot because of Sunday school, the other stories, and all the rest. And also, of course, some of them who have accepted Christ as their saviour. The question, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Do you realise do you realize what that question is? It is the most profound question that each of us must answer. It is the only question in the history of creation that has a true eternal dimension. The answer to that question is the direction you're taking. Plenty of people in the Bible. Let's, let's have a look at a couple of people in the Bible. Our Bible stories, stories that we would have heard as children. Zacchaeus. He knew about Jesus. You remember when Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a 
tax collector, was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, couldn't see him over the crowd, he ran ahead and got into a tree to give him a bit of a view down so that he could see Jesus. And verse 4 in, in Luke 19 says, So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree, a sycamore stroke fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming. Now listen, that day, that he could see Jesus that day. Keep a hold of that day. We know that something changed for Zacchaeus that day. What changed? What changed for the man? He was merely curious. He knew about Jesus. He had heard the stories around the countryside. This man's actually healing people, you know, and you want to hear him speak, and he's a great speaker in the synagogue, and blah, blah, and it went on, and he said, now, he didn't go out, Zacchaeus didn't go out seeking Jesus. He simply heard that Jesus happened to be coming that way, that day. And he thought, I must have a go. I must go up and have a wee quick look and see, what is this man like? But something happened that day. The Lord Jesus knew his name. He had just come into the town, but he knew his name. He knew his occupation. He knew all about him. And he asked him if he could go to his home. And the result was that Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 here and I, I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of them, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house. On that day, a day I believe was appointed by God in the life of Zacchaeus. And I let, and. and, and Days that I believe are appointed by God in your lives. Some of you have may, may have already been there on that day. Today, salvation has come to that day. So, guess curiosity was repaid with the beginning of a new relationship. The tax collector set aside his treasure his earthly treasure, because he had discovered where his heart's treasure really was in a relationship with Christ. That was his treasure, his new found treasure. My advice to you, are you curious about this man, Jesus? Do you think you know him well from the stories? Don't dampen your curiosity. Keep searching. Keep seeking to taste. Because one day, that day, Jesus is going to confront you. Make no bones about it. Rich wrong ruler, what about him? He knew about Jesus. How do we know that? Well, he came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to, get in, to have eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. And this young man pushed him on it. This man said, Here, wait a minute, you're not telling me enough here. Which ones do you want me to open up here, Jesus, and tell me? Which ones do you want me to keep? Jesus didn't say them all. He gave him some. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother and love your neighbor. And of course, the young fella felt a sigh of relief. I've done all that. 
He said, all these I have kept. What's do I, what do I still lack? You see, what the young man was coming, it was a disingenuous sort of a question he asked. He wasn't really wanting Jesus to tell him at all. What he really wanted us to do was to de- demonstrate to Jesus what he was already doing in the hope that Jesus would rubber stamp it. You're okay, man. You're in. And instead he got a different answer. How many of us in churches, including myself, went through those days when we, we felt we were towing the line scripturally. We felt that we were keeping the commandments. We were learning to live a pretty decent life, as I would say in Belfast, a bit of a decent life. Only to find out one day when we met him, on that day, when I met him, instead of saying, Roy, you're going well, he didn't do it because my well was leading me to hell. (laughs) My way was leading me to a lost eternity. Only his way. And remember the other thing. Remember in the scriptures when it talks about um, it talks about uh, the the the, the, uh, the commandments. And Jesus said quite plainly, "Listen, if you if you failed in one of the commandments, you failed in them all. So there's no point. You know." Jesus said, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father." By me. On the day when I stand in front of my Creator God, I would have nothing to plead because I know my way was pretty grim, pretty useless, no matter how good I thought it was. But thank the Lord I have a, an advocate in the Lord Jesus Christ. I often, I hope I'm not being heretical here, but I often feel that in front of God I'll have the son, uh, Jesus, arguing a very strong case for me. And do you know what his case is? It's not, actually, he didn't really mean to do that. You know, I know he failed at times, but no, no. There was only one argument Jesus has in front of the Father. See that man, Roy Fleming, or that man, or that man, or that woman, or that woman? They have me. That's the only case to be made. They have me. They don't just know about me. They know me, and I know them. That's the only answer. The Apostle Paul, when he was called Saul, do you remember? Do you remember that time when Stephen was having a rough time preaching. I think that was about uh, four, if I remember correctly, reading somewhere, it was about four or five years actually after Jesus' death and resurrection. But whatever the case anyway, uh, Stephen, like many of the Christians, were out and they were telling others about the Lord Jesus. And then the crowd around him was this young man called Saul. This man called Saul. And the people who were barracking Stephen took off their garments and threw them at the feet of Saul. And you will know that in the early days in Acts, there was a fear Christians were, there was a bit of a fear and uncertainty about Paul who had on that day met Jesus on the road and met him, seen him, talked to him and was changed dramatically, was saved that day.
I did Saul as a young man view Jesus. He viewed him as a threat to the old law, a threat to the old religion. Here's a question. Do we see Jesus as a threat? Do we wish, oh, go away, you're disturbing my way of life? Or I don't want to listen. I think I've got my act together in the church and in my life, and I'm pretty certain God will be pleased with me. Paul persecuted the Christians because he thought Jesus was threatening the status quo. Daily, without even any interest in spiritual things, we we meet people who know plenty about Jesus. People today, just like this rich young man, the tax collector, know enough about Jesus to make them perhaps curious, perhaps as a teacher, perhaps a good man, perhaps someone they, they only turn to when they had problems, perhaps they view Jesus as someone they would wish just would go away. Have you heard that expression before in that day? I met a young girl many years ago. I was in a a service up in North Brazil. And uh, before, a few of us were visiting the church. And I was struck, one of the lessons I learned from that church, a little church in a little village in the interior Amazing, amazing people. And we'd been there for two or three weeks and uh, all over the place. We'd been in little jungle village and all sorts of things. And uh, this girl was sitting beside me in the church on the last service before we came home. And you will know the man I'm going to talk about now. James Cochran. Do you know James? No. Nope. Maybe it may may, may not be one of your missionary outreach. Well, James Cochran and Heather, great friends of ours, and he was the pastor there uh, and started that little church up. And he got up at the front of the church and he said, now, our friends are going back to Ireland. I want the Christians to come up to the front of the church. (gasps) I thought to myself, wow. To do that, I want the Christians to come to the front of the church. Well, your expectation may be that everybody will walk up to the front of the church, but that didn't happen. And the young girl beside me, who who did a lot of work for Heather and so on, and was very involved in things around the place, and I said to her, are you not going up? And this is what she said to me. And this struck me and my heart with an honesty we rarely ever get. But an honesty that is needed if people are serious about getting to heaven. She said, Roy, I'm not yet a Christian, but God is dealing with my heart. She's a Christian now, but God is dealing with my heart. What honesty is that? The teaching in that church was clear. There was no sense that people should feel ashamed that they had not yet surrendered because there's fears and there's worries and everybody who is saved knows that ooh, just getting over the line is a big issue. But there was the honest. What was happening was she was just moving in God's grace towards that day. When, God, uh, when Jesus would finally confront her. It's worth remembering that Jesus specifically mentions Samaria when he tells his disciples, you remember in Acts 1, verse 8, 
You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so despite all animosities between Jews and Samaritans, it is God's will and was God's will that the people of Samaria would come to him. The story here also shows us that we can start out our day. We can open the door into the world outside. And we have a purpose in mind. The lady at the well, the purpose? To get water for the day. But she knew, didn't know then that that was not just a day. It was that day in her life when Jesus would confront Jesus would declare and leave her with little of any excuse but to say, I have found the Savior. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. That woman realized that the questions being asked were questions to which Jesus knew every single answer. Jesus had to this place, I presume, for the first time. He knew her life inside out. On that day, when you hear the questions in your mind, on that day, do you know what Jesus is doing? Because he already knows. He's asking you the question so that you will answer them. He's asking the questions because he knows the the answers. But he wants you to answer them for yourself. Lies, I remember my dad used to say to me years ago, nothing based, nothing built on lies will ever prosper. Well, let me tell you there's something even more profound that I believe. Lies are a terrible thing. They're a horrible thing. There's only thing, one thing that telling people lies. And the one thing that's worth is telling yourself lies. No worse lie than the lies we tell ourselves. And when Jesus confronts you on that day, he knows the truth. He knows the answers. And he wants you to answer honestly. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Isn't it interesting, and I'm not much, a couple of minutes off, It's interesting, I think, that she ran with enthusiasm to tell people. She started her day trying to avoid people. Remember, she went at 12 o'clock during the day at the heat of the sun so that none of the rest of the people would be there. Such was her reputation. Such were the attitudes of people in the village towards her. That woman, she's at five foot. She's living with a boy now. All of this stuff. But... After an encounter with Jesus, that went out the window. She, was, she threw the bucket down. Off she went to tell the people. Boy, what a powerful meeting. Transformation in that life because she met Jesus. She was able to go and confront the people in the church and say, uh, in the town and say, I've met this guy. You've got to come to see this guy. He told me, everything about myself. He knew everything about me. We can all be in this position where we can say this with joy. Remember they're talking about the water? Isaiah 12 says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day (laughs) you will say, give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name 
is exalted. The lady had got her water and she's got a friend. On that day, Jesus will cease to be a storybook character and instead will be a solid saviour. On that day, a religion changes into a relationship an eternal loving relationship. If you merely know the stories on one seemingly ordinary day, Jesus will encounter you. What you know about Jesus and what he knows about you will be used by him to begin a relationship that will last into eternity. You will truly know him and commit your life to his leading. And I finish. What is di- what's the difference in a tentative grip, a loose grip, and a real relationship with Jesus? A sort of knowing and a real relationship. Well, it's this. If you merely know about Jesus... This world can easily snap you out of his presence. But if you truly know him, John 10, 28, 29, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I leave those thoughts with you. And I leave another thought with you. I think I maybe mentioned this on my sessions here the last time. A very dear, dear friend who was with me in Brazil at that time said to me once and said to our congregation, Christianity is not one of the world's great religions. Christianity is not one of the world's great religions. The world's great religions know about. They know about God. They know that there's some obligation to please him in some way. And so the world's great religions begin to climb and claw their way back through works and through ritual to please the God creator. But in Christ, God reached right down and redeemed us. We are not one of the world's great religions. We are a relationship with the creator, God, through Christ. I think that's a marvelous, marvelous way to see him. We are not a religion going through the rituals. We are warmly clasped in the embrace of our Savior, and we are a relationship. Let's pray. Father God, I just pray for Kilmore this morning. I pray for these lovely people who, when I've been about here, have been so kindly towards me. There is a warmth here, Lord, and I thank you for it. And Father, I pray that each of us will know that greater warmth, the warmth of a father who doesn't shout across, fear not, A Father God who instead whispers in our ear, fear not, as he holds us in his warm embrace. Father, we praise you and thank you for Jesus. And Lord, set upon each of our hearts to know him better, 
who thoroughly know him and not just stories about him. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing to finish our day and we're singing before the throne of God about, above. Is that, is that the one? Yeah. Sorry? Oh, sorry. All, oh, I've got to run. <laughs> all I once held here. I can write it down, but sometimes I can't, I can't write it down. <laughs> all I once held here. Let's stand and sing. <laughs> And we say the benediction together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.